Hello listeners and welcome to the Montel Weekly Podcast, bringing you energy matters in an informal setting. In this week's pod, we're in Iceland. Iceland's power sector has one of the lowest carbon footprints in the world and generates electricity predominantly from hydropower and geothermal sources. It may not be physically connected to other parts of Europe, not yet anyway, but its power prices to industrials are linked to the Nordic market. Helping me, Snjord with Richard Sverdesson, to talk about energy development in Iceland and beyond is Hörður Ardason, CEO of the country's largest power producer, Landsvirkjun. A warm welcome to you, Hörður. Thank you. Um, let's start by talking about Landsvirkjun. So what, what's what's new in, in, in your company, Hörður? Were there any exciting new developments? No, of course, you know, we are continuously you know, developing new power projects. Uh, we have a strong pipeline of power projects in, in hydro, geothermal and now also wind. And uh, we have also been developing a lot of our customer base. Uh, we are lo- looking a lot into the energy transition that is needed in Iceland. Uh, the main thing is how do we get renewable energy to the mobility sector. So we are continuously working on e-fuel projects and, and use of direct electricity. So I think um, uh, quite a lot of activity, strong demand, and then the strong and uh, solid pipeline of new projects. Mm. Excellent. We'll maybe go into those in more detail a little bit later, I hope. Um, but uh, how are developments in Iceland relevant to the wider European energy market, would you say? No, we have. We are very fortunate in Iceland, you know, we have, uh, because, you know, we are, uh, you know, with, we have already now 100% renewable electricity system and uh, the, the district heating, uh, you know, that is also 100% renewable, mainly geothermal. So we are not... Uh, so dependent on fossil fuels and uh, the energy crisis we see in Europe. So we have uh, very stable prices, uh, quite competitive uh, also, especially with regard to the situation in Iceland. So both security of supply, both to industries and households and and, uh, stable prices are, I think, uh, very important for the country in current situations. Mm. So would you say Iceland's been shielded from the energy crisis that we've seen in Europe or the energy price crisis, maybe more correctly said? Yes, completely shielded. And uh, so, so as I said, we have uh, had very stable prices and uh, a very limited increase because of this crisis. Mm. So we are, uh, yes, uh, I think Iceland has shown that the, the, the strong build out of renewable energy is, is uh, providing uh, uh, a lot of uh, very important uh, security for Iceland. Mm. And is that, are you seeing increased interest from, for example, in the industrial sector, um, companies wishing to, to relocate to or just locate in Iceland? Yes, we see very strong interest. And uh, uh, so we are, uh, our, our, we are fully utilizing our system today. It's, it's just running on the ads. Mm. Uh, we are using, uh, producing, uh, selling every megawatt hour that we can produce. Uh, we, you know, our current customers that have, are already in Iceland are, fully utilizing their factories, uh, of course, because they are in a very competitive environment. And on top of that, we have very strong demand from very interesting or from many interesting industries mm. that uh, want to re- relocate and, and come to Iceland. But unfortunately, we don't have so much uh, energy available. Mm. So we have to prioritize a lot. Mm. And uh, further build out will be a lot linked to further, uh, uh, further, you know, build out of industry in Iceland will be very linked to, you know, uh, new uh, uh, power coming online. Mm-hmm. So can you say anything about the type of industrial sectors that are that are looking to relocate to, to Iceland? I mean, traditionally, it's been the aluminium sector. Yeah, of yeah, course. yeah. And we, you know, we have said that, you know, we are, uh, you know, we are, want to support our current customers, the aluminium industry. And the silicon metal industry, they are very important customers for us. And we, we see them definitely as uh, part of the future in our, our uh, portfolio. Uh, very stable, reliable uh, industry. Uh, but we see the industries that we have been focusing on and want to accommodate in the, in the future is, is kind of what we call more green industries. Uh, we see a lot of interest from uh, the food processing industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, land-based uh, fish farming uh, is a lot of activity there that is quite power intense. Uh, we see also in, in uh, algae production and and uh, and uh, different kinds of food productions. Uh, we see data centers. We already have data centers in Iceland that are expanding, and and we expect to see more of them. 
uh, very importantly, you know, we are not see, focusing there on Bitcoin or mining. You know, they are not part of the future. Mm -hmm. It's more kind of the 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 the, the data centers that are providing an important role in the society, storing data, heavy computer, heavy, heavy computing for for science, uh, for design, and 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 and, and, and medical purposes. Uh, so uh, and then and then of course the energy transition the 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 production of e-fuels uh, strong demand for that in Iceland uh, but our focus will be on supporting at least in the beginning projects that are serving the Icelandic market that I we think that is a natural steps to do that but the, these projects could then later on when more energy is available maybe developing and also exporting e-fuels but in the in the beginning we focus on e-fuels mm. for for domestic use mm, absolutely so i think if you then uh, if you look at the electricity price in other parts of europe this must surely you know very very high prices uh some degree of shutdowns uh in big industrial sectors this must of course benefit benefit iceland and people looking to iceland where you have stable competitive prices yes yes and of course we are seeing a, a small uh, we are seeing an increase in prices and we can say that the electricity prices in iceland are uh, okay they are stable and competitive but we see similar prices for example in northern norway in canada so we are, I would say, the power intensive in Iceland, uh, in, in Iceland is getting similar price in Iceland as, as it gets uh, in the most competitive place in, 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 uh, in countries that you compare to. But, but we also want to sell at a price that is similar in other places. But, but uh, for, uh, for the power intensive industry to survive and, uh, and grow, you know, we need to have competitive prices. We, they cannot... Uh, withstand these heavy fluctuations that we have seen in Europe. That's completely impossible for power intensive industries. Absolutely. There's been a lot of talk of, you know, the prospect of deindustrialization as well, which is obviously worrying for, for, for many countries. Not not Iceland, of course, but uh, where in what what ways can you can you expand the, the capacity? Can you can you build more hydro or where where are the possibilities? Wind? Is that is that something that you, you need to look at if you were to attract new customers to, to Iceland? You know that, of course, depends on on what the the government decides. You know what what will be. You know we have a framework pro program, a clear legislation how the government selects uh, areas that can be used for renewable energy production. But there's no doubt that Iceland has good possibilities, further possibilities in hydro. Uh, we have uh, also some projects that we can even start now in geothermal. That we have also also good project. But the third pillar is wind. Uh, there are very good wind conditions in Iceland. Mm. Uh, we have on land uh, in remote locations uh, far from where people live, similar conditions as you as you have at sea, you know, with, with high, very high utilization factor. So that is a definitely a strong third pillar. Mm. But we have, uh, if you look at our portfolio, that is me looking at now, maybe starting in the, in the next one or two years, we have a project uh, a 100 megawatt hydro project in Lower Thjorsa, mm -hmm. uh, Kvammer. Uh, we have a uh, 100 megawatt uh, uh, expansion of the geothermal plant at Thistreger. Mm. Uh, we have an expansion expansion pro uh, project in one of our older plants, Sigalda, where we might be adding about 50 megawatts. And then we got the permission for the two first wind farms in Iceland, one close to Burfell, uh, capacity of 120 megawatts, and another one in the north, close to Blanda, which can go up to 200 megawatts. So, so we have this is this is uh, the portfolio where we have you know gone, done, done most of the permitting process, mm. and uh, many of them we might uh, start uh, uh, next year or the year after. Mm. So the portfolio is strong. Mm. I mean, I think you know. In other parts of, of Europe, you have a big problem with the permitting process, the so-called NIMBY issues. Uh, Iceland is, is a stunningly beautiful country, um, you know, has a very strong tourism sector. Is there a lot of opposition to wind farms in the country, both from, from the residents and also from maybe from the tourism sector? Yes, I think, you know, renewable energy projects or anywhere in the world, you know, there is a, a big debate and I think that's healthy. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, if we are going to fight the climate issue, and and uh, and uh, what's the main main project there is to phase out the fossil fuel use, uh, and then we need a lot of renewable energy, and so we have to discuss that openly. How will we do that? 
uh, but we you know we continuously make uh, for example polls with uh, with the tourists you know how what they feel about the about the, uh, the energy production in Iceland and uh, 95 97% are very positive and even say that the energy system in Iceland is one of the key reasons for them to come to Iceland one of the top 5 reasons mm -hmm. so uh, the tourists are very positive to to the energy built out in Iceland uh, and many of our current plants are in the highlands today, uh, the reservoirs and the hydro plants, and people see them as part of the nature. Mm. And th these are, uh, you know, the very big attractions for the tourists. So I think uh, definitely this, uh, the built out of power intensive in, in the power generation in Iceland has had no negative impact on the tourism industry. And I don't see any reason for that should happen in the future. Mm. On the contrary, as, as I said, it's more attracting tourists, they say themselves. But there are, you know, of course, people and that want to preserve the nature mm. and as it is, and and we should respect their view, and we fully understand that. We try to develop our projects in such a way that we limit the impact of, of our projects as much as possible. But it is impossible to produce renewable energy without having some impact. And how, to, you know, uh, uh, and uh, and if we are going to stop using fossil fuels, which we have to do. Uh, and uh, then we have to accept these projects and we have to remember also what is the impact on you know getting the oil or the coal out of the out of the ground it has a huge local impact and and uh, people cannot just uh, you know forget that well while, while they are talking renewable energy projects but this is one of the biggest uh, uh, kind of tasks we have ahead of us how can we take this discussion with the society uh, how can we, you know, link the demand for for or, or, or the fight against climate issues, climate climate changes, uh, with the need for renewable energy? Fossil fuels are responsible for about seventy three percent of of CO two emissions in the world. Mm. So, so if we are going to stop doing that, uh, we need to accept these projects. Mm -hmm. Not all of it, but we need to you know, do a huge build out of renewable energy in, in all around the world. And this is discussed a lot now at COP27 uh, COP in, 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 in Egypt. And we see the, the sec Secretary General of the United Nations just uh, begging countries around the world, please stop, uh, uh, please, uh, uh, please allow these projects to go forward. Stop fighting against them. This is just uh, a must for the, for the world. Absolutely, and and the permitting issues are of course uh, a key here, or the real a lot of the the, the main obstacle for for a lot of projects, mm. uh, not just in Iceland but uh, but across the world. Really, um, is there there was some talk uh, a few years ago about um, a cable connecting Iceland to, to <clears> the <throat> UK, potentially even to Norway? Is that now off the table? Or is it still you know still being talked about? Uh, it's not uh, any, any 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 priority in the discussions. We you know this is a political decision, and you know we supported this project quite a lot about five six years ago, and this is uh, uh, I think a very good idea. This is a uh, could be very uh, economical for Iceland. It could also also be a big uh, uh, improvement of security of supply in Iceland. So I think it's a good uh, good project. But uh, the, the, the politicians have to decide if this we should do that. And uh, there is no discussions about that now. Mm. So I see, think it's not on the table, but uh, you know, it's uh, quite possible it will be again on the table you know, when we start uh, looking at the options we have. Mm. Given the, the price spreads, I mean, it obviously be, would be quite lucrative uh, in a sense. The, the economics of such a cable have, got, have improved considerably over in the middle of this energy crisis, of course, we don't know what the future will bring, but certainly in terms of price at the moment, they seem, it seems very, very, um, very beneficial. Yes, and that is kind of also the key to the to the this energy transition to to elect electrify, uh, you know, the power energy systems of the world. It will be very important to connect energy systems, and there is no doubt if you look 20, 30, 40 years into the future. I think the, the 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 Arctic or the northern part of the hemisphere is very well suited for renewable energy production, and uh, it's highly likely that we will use areas there, mm -hmm. uh, and then we have to transport that energy uh, to Europe or to the US, uh, and I think uh, then Iceland. I'm sure that Iceland will discuss, you know, when this happens all around us, maybe in Greenland and uh, mm -hmm. and other areas. 
uh, uh, how should we be a part of this or can we play a role there? Mm -hmm. And it, it's not only economical, but it's also security of supply. It's better utilization of the natural resource in Iceland. There are, there are many benefits. But, but as I said, this is a political decision. It's not on the agenda today. Mm -hmm. uh, we at Landsverk strongly believe this is a thing that we should investigate fully. Mm -hmm. And we believe it's a good project. But we, we, this is not, we are not prioritizing any work on this uh, in the coming years. Okay, that's interesting. It's also highly political, as we, we've seen in, 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 in the Nordic region with, in Norway, where there's been a bit of a backlash against the cables because people maintain that it has increased prices for domestic users quite dramatically. Now, it, it goes, but goes both ways because you can export, but you can also import sometimes you know, um, of, of, of low energy capacity or low utilization within yeah. within uh, the country. Yeah, but people have to remember that, uh, you know, the, the problem in Norway, although I understand discussions, is not because of the cable, it's because Russia is using energy as a weapon and, and uh, to support our, uh, the friendly nations in, in, in Europe in a, in a situation like this. Uh, I think that is, uh, I think Norway should be proud of that. And on, at the same time, they are earning a lot of money. So, so I, I don't think this is, a, is, a, uh, uh, is, 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 I think this is a, something that I, I, I think Norway should be, is good for Norway. Mm. But I, I think, um, as I said, this is because of that Russia is using uh, energy as a weapon. It's also because Germany was relying far too much on, on, on Russia, uh, uh, partly because of uh, NIMBYs, you know, that you don't want to have energy production in your backyard. Um, but I think this is hopefully temporary, uh, mm. but uh, interconnecting power systems uh, in a renewable world is a must. Mm. It's not something, but just uh, otherwise the renewable energy systems will not work. Mm. They have to be as much interconnected as possible. Absolutely. And I think one way of doing this, I mean, I, I talked to you about this topic a couple of years ago was was green hydrogen. Uh, where 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 do you stand now on on the on green hydrogen and at Landsberg? Yeah, we are following that discussion quite a lot, and and uh, we are now uh, you know working officially on on the, on the kind of developing two projects. We have not started them, and we have not uh, decided what which role we will play or who we will work with. But we would like to. Uh, we strongly believe that Iceland should start hydro hydrogen production uh, for, for road transport for, for the cars. And also at the same time, we are saying that we should start uh, methanol pro uh, production uh, to aiming at the, 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 the ships. Uh, uh, so, so we are uh, uh, developing those projects um, uh, and hope that uh, late next year we could uh, be in a situation to take an investment decision. But I think Iceland needs to move in that direction as other countries. We see all other countries are doing similar. Mm. And the land we can plan to support that strongly. Uh, but we need to focus, as I said earlier, we need to focus on projects that will also help us reaching our climate targets in Iceland. We have strong commitments toward the Paris Agreement coming up in 2030. It is quite difficult in Iceland because, you know, we have already done the easy things, the electricity and the space heating. Mm. Uh, so, to, so for us to fulfill uh, our obligations, you know, we, <clears throat> we have to look at the mobility sector, uh, the car ships, uh, um, uh, mainly cars and ships. And, and uh, direct electrification is, of course, very positive when, where that's possible. But uh, e-fuels, uh, uh, the hydrogen, methanol, ammonia, E kerosene, you know, they will play a role, and we our our conclusion was that at these states, uh, hydrogen and methanol are the the projects that should move on, mm. and we are at, uh, we are developing that and then looking for partners uh, mm. to to work with us, uh, you know, on that both in the production but also as off takers. Mm. I mean, I, I think it's fascinating. There's been a bit of criticism about hydrogen in terms of the efficiency, what the efficiency of of burning it as a fuel. Um, uh, but do you do you do you take those on board? That, that yeah, yeah, I think uh, that's uh, that's very uh, that's, uh, that's good argument. But we also have to remember if we use direct electrification, uh, that that means we, we have to put a lot of batteries on the cars, especially the heavy, you know for heavy transport. Uh, then we have to use a lot of energy moving the batteries around. Mm. So that's uh, there's also drawbacks there. Mm. But uh, but direct electrification where it's possible is better. Mm. But I think everybody agrees, at least with current technologies, we will have to find some other energy carriers, uh, uh, 
based on hydrogen or hydrogen derivatives mm. and um, and we just have to have to accept uh, that uh, the yield there is lower than direct electrification mm. absolutely um, I, I mentioned in in the intro about you know the a lot of your uh, contracts with industrial com- companies are linked to the Nord Pool price um I see you renegotiated a deal with Norderald. Uh, could you say some words about that? What, what, what was the deal there? Yes, of course. Uh, you know, it is, uh, there, there was a part of you know, Norderald had uh, hatched a big part of their uh, position there, but there was a part that was unhatched. Uh, and with this uh, high volatility and very high prices, kind of we, we could, uh, uh, you know, which would, would make their situation quite difficult. Uh, so we agreed to to change that contract uh, to uh, a part of it uh, to uh, more of a fixed-price contract, but we did also then on the to, to balance that out. We we in another contract uh, put in an LME uh, uh, connection uh, to the aluminium prices, so it was kind of a win-win situation, making it easier for for Northern to cope with those incredibly high prices we see in North Norpool, uh, but on the other hand, giving us similar income but over a longer period. So, mm. so this is how we want to work with our customers to, if there is an unexpected situation, uh, we want to solve it together, taking into consideration the the, the interest of both companies. Mm. Were you surprised last year when they published all the details of a lot of their contracts? No, we did, did that in agreement with them. We, okay. uh, mm. we, we have a policy that, you know, we think it's good to publish the contracts, maybe Im- not immediately when we sign them. Mm. But maybe uh, three, four years after they are signed, we say that it's quite natural these, that these contracts are public. Mm. We are a big publicly owned company, so our contracts are not secret. But but publishing them at, at the time you sign it, that's maybe not, for business purposes is not uh, not uh, <clears throat> not clever mm-hmm. uh, because you are making all sorts of other contracts, and then people want to always to cherry pick from the contracts. So, mm-hmm. but we we uh, would uh, we have uh, we are very uh, want to be as transparent as possible. Mm-hmm. You know, ten years ago we started publishing the average prices to these power intensive industries, mm-hmm. and uh, we think uh, there is no uh, business interest in keeping them <clears throat> secret for a very long time. Mm. There was in Norway, and there was a lot of um, attention on low reservoir levels and the potential for rationing. Now, there was a drought earlier this, there was sort of low reservoir levels in Iceland mm. earlier this year, was there not? And there was some degree of rationing to industrial customers or there was a lot of interest in, in that anyway in, in the Nordic region? Yeah, yeah. we had uh, uh, our last winter, we had a period of time in the middle of the winter with very little inflow to our, our reservoirs, but this was completely in line with our models. There was nothing unexpected. Mm. At the same time, the load on the system was close to the maximum capacity we can have. So it's quite natural in that situation that we uh, are curtail part of the contracts. So this is part of the uh, agreement with the power intensive industries that uh, in uh, periods of that, uh, you know, we can curtail a part of it. So I think it was for three months that we used that curtailment, uh, but this is this is just a part of running a, a big hydro system in a closed electricity system. So we have good hydro years, and then we have other years which are not not so good. And just to have a responsible uh, usage or utilization, it is important that you know when when there is a bad year, that they can share the flexibility with us. Mm. Uh, but this was just in, got done in a very good cooperation with and with the full understanding of our customers. On the other hand, now we have a good level, and even now in in at this time of the year, you know, late uh, later this year, that uh, that we are uh, the inflow is strong now. We have a lot of rain this this weeks, so we are uh, for last week and uh, for the coming weeks we are seeing more inflow to the reservoirs. Mm. Or they are rising the reservoirs, which is un- very unusual for this time of the year. Absolutely, looking out the window here, you see a bit of rain and, and wind, so very good for renewable energy production. Yeah, we are one of the few people in Iceland that are very glad when it rains. <laughs> Perfect. That's um, a good weather. Absolutely. Um, Herder, just a last question, really. Um, there's a lot of new legislation coming out at the EU level, uh, and one of them, I think, you know, which is important for, for Iceland and for renewable generators, is the Renewable Energy Directive. Uh, and the impact on guarantees of origin. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, that's 
you know, Iceland has <clears> exported <throat> a lot of these to, to continental Europe and other parts of Europe over, over the years. But according to what I see draft proposals, you will have to have a physical interconnection with the market that you sell guarantees of origin to, as far as I understand it. Um, what, what do you make of these proposals on the table? I think that you know this 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 uh, this is still in discussions, and I think uh, this is uh, uh, I think you know if we see uh, the the uh, the built out of renewable energy and the the and the, the tackle of the, of the climate change, we should not put that in as a demand. You know that's uh, that's not logical if you because you want to support built out of renewable energy in 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 Europe, uh, then then that should not be a decision because you can never you know be sure or make sure that the, the energy that you uh, is, is the certificate you buy that you get that energy you, you never get it so it i think it's, it's nice i hope that will not be the, the result i think that's not good for the purpose of the system mm. because the purpose of the system is to is to build out renewable energy mm. and um, and we we can also see that we will probably have energy islands you know in europe that will must be a part of the solution uh, to, for example, to to produce uh, e-fuels, uh, are we not going to support those systems? You know, this, uh, you know, you know that's uh, so that would be a, a, a not a good step and uh, and not in line with the spirit of the of the, of, the, of this uh, the scheme to support renewable energy production. And we should really focusing on increasing the support of renewable energy, not decreasing it. Yeah, and I'd certainly had. Uh... Prices now at uh, a euro, eight euros a megawatt hour. Mm. They're certainly much, much providing much more of an incentive to, mm -hmm. to roll out renewables than they maybe would have done uh, two yeah, or three that, years ago. Yeah, that's having a very positive impact on the on the uh, uh, built-out renewable energy and also reducing the need for public support and uh, very likely lowering the energy prices. Which mm. uh, so I think finally when the system is working, we should support it, uh, not uh, not uh, start undermining it. Perfect order. Thank you very much for joining the Montel Weekly Podcast. Thank you. So listeners, you can now follow the podcast on our own Twitter account, aptly named the Montel Weekly Podcast. Please direct message, any suggestions, questions, or, you know, let us know if you, if you think you have a good idea for a guest on the show. You can also send us an email to podcast at montelnews.com. Lastly, remember to keep up to date with all that's happening in energy markets on Montel News. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts and Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. Thank you and goodbye.